Okay, so good morning everyone. My name is Fabrice Droit. I work at Async and we're one of the team building Lightning implementations. And today I'll speak about how we designed and implemented our own uh, Lightning nodes and what were the drivers for the technical choices we made and, and how it works today. So Lightning, I think you all know about this. Uh, it's live on mainnet, it's, it's usable. Every, everybody's been buying coffee with um, Lightning since yesterday. And Lightning is, is, is very different from other projects in crypto because Lightning starts with a, an open source specifications, um, which is quite complete now. It's implementable <coughs> Uh, just by reading the spec, it's, it's hard work, but you can read the specs and implement Lightning, which is, I think, unique in crypto. There are no projects that have a, uh, this type of structure. Uh, so you have the, the, the Lightning specs describe the wire messages, the binary messages you need to send to other nodes to communicate with them, the transport layer that includes encryption and uh, authentication, the format for the transactions that you, yeah, that you signed, uh, how you discover other nodes, um, it, it's, it's, it's very complete and it's very low level. And today there are several independent open source implementations of Lightning. This also is, is unique. Um, even though some people have different opinions about this, the consensus is that implementing a Bitcoin node is really difficult and may not be a good idea because you would, do, you would need to do exactly what the other nodes are doing. With Lightning, it's different because there is no global consensus. So it's a, it's a client-server system, and what you do has an impact only on, your, on the peers you are connected to. So it's really easy to have completely different implementations, and it's really easy to upgrade and to switch implementations. This is why we have now C Lightning and Eclair and LND and Tarmigan and Rust Lightning and people working on Python. Um, so you, you can have completely different implementation choices, languages, and it's, it still work together. And usually when, when we talk about different implementations, um, when, you think, when you think about C, everybody thinks about like, okay, uh, bearded guy, takes a network cable, puts it to its song and says, oh, this is SSL handshake between Ubuntu and Linux, or whatever, like deep bearded stuff. And Rust and Go, it's like, Okay, it's, it's, they're the cool kids. Rust is, is even cooler than, 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 than Go now, I think, when it comes to, to implementing crypto. But when we say we use Scala, usually the first reaction is nobody really knows Scala. Who knows what Scala is? Okay, so it's, it's about like half. So then I, ex I have to explain it runs on the JVM, and, and this happens. It's, uh, <laughs> and not really. Uh, the JVM is truly really amazing and Scala is a really good language on the JVM and I, I, I'll try to explain why we chose this and why we think it's, 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 it's a really good fit. So th th what is Lightning? Briefly, Lightning is a piece of network of payment channels and a payment channel is basically an unpublished transaction that spans from a funding transaction that is uh, published and all everything about Lightning is how do you update your state? How you update that transaction that has been that is not published that is pending your commitment transaction? So you start. In this case, Alice opens a channel to Bob. She has ten beacons for her, nothing for Bob. And when she pays Bob, she's actually, she's actually changing the way the balance is split between Alice and Bob. That, that that's what Lightning is about. How you update a transaction that is not published that is publishable, uh, and that spans a funding transaction at ease on the blockchain. <coughs> and basically, this is the job of a Lightning channel. You have, it, it, it looks a bit complex, but you have a commitment transaction that gives money to you, money to, to Bob in this case. You have a list of pending payments, outgoing payments, incoming payments. For each payment, you have HGLC transactions, so it's all of this is your state that you need to maintain and update. That's the job of a channel. And Lightning is a network of payment channels. So if you, if you implement a node, 
The job of your node is to maintain connections to your peers and for each peer to maintain the channels that are linked to that connection. Lightning worth, works with a, a single connection to every peer you're connected to and channels are multiplexed over that single connection. So you can have uh, many channels for, for the same, with the same peer, but they all uh, use the same uh, TCP connection. So basically, that's what a node is, is, is doing. It's connecting using TCP connections to connect to other peers, and it's maintaining channels, and there could be several channels for each of the peers you're connected to. And the protocol, the Lightning protocol is, is, is I not that overwhelming. Basically, you have a state, that's your commitment transaction, and you're sending messages to your peers to say, this is how I want to change my state. You add updates, and the updates, for example, is a payment, and it's, it's a batching uh, protocol, which means you send many, many, many updates, and when you want to commit to the update, you sign all the updates you've sent. And when you sign, you receive a revocation secret. That's the trick we use in Lightning to say that you have many, many states that are valid, but only the last one is, is safe to use because for well, the other ones, if you publish, this is, I think, something everybody knows about. If you publish an old state, there's some kind of uh, short circuit in all your outputs that makes it possible for your uh, counterparty to, to get all, all your funds. So the, the secret, uh, the private key, basically, to the private revocation key is what you send as a revocation. That's, that's why only the later state is safe to use. So it's, it's, a, it's a batching protocol, you send updates, you sign the updates, in return you receive a rev revocation, and you go on and you go on. So, so basically what you have is something that exchanges messages over uh, TCP connections, that updates uh, a state, and that for that state maintains a local view of your commitment transaction, and a remote view of your counterparty's commitment transaction. And this is what you sign. When you, when, you, when you sign something in Lightning, you're signing the other guy's commitment transaction. So when they receive your signatures, they, they can check that their new commitment is valid. It does spend the funding transaction and it, all the SGLC's outputs and everything is, is, is correct. So basically, a channel is a state machine. From a functional point of view, that's, that's, what, that's what it is. Every time you receive a message, you transition to a new updated state and optionally, you send a message back. And you need to, to do a lot of bookkeeping, you need to maintain uh, routing information, you need to maintain link information about uh, payments that you relay, where do they come from, what is uh, the uh, upstream channel, where do you send them to, what is the downstream channel. When you get the pre-image from the downstream channel, you have to send it back to the upstream channel. When you fail the payments downstream, you have to fail it upstream. So this, a lot of bookkeeping information that you need to take care of. So basically, the design constraints that we see in a Lightning channel is you need something that manages incoming and outgoing TCP connections. You have to pipe all the messages you receive to channel state machines. You obviously need good cryptographic libraries. Uh, you need good Bitcoin libraries. And if you want to build something that you can actually use in production, you want something that is, that is fairly, that has good performance and from a CPU and memory point of view. You need good tooling. If you want to run something in production, you need good build tool, you need uh, to, to have good tools to deploy applications, you need good debugging, monitoring tools, and you'd like to have something that is portable, that you can run on, on several operating systems. Uh, so this is what we had in mind when we started implementing Lightning. Basically, our goal was we want to build something that we can use ourselves in production. That's been always our target. We run nodes on testnet and mainnet big, big nodes. And our, our main criteria is, is it something that I want to use in production? What are the frictions we see in production? And this what, what has been driving the choices we've made. We develop nodes that we are, we're, the, we're our first clients, basically our first customers, that's us. It's open source, but our first users, it's us. So what we were looking for is, is a good runtime, something that it, that works well, that is 
easy to understand what, what's going on in production, whether the memory, CPU issues, uh, how can you monitor what's going on, that is portable. We need a good programming language, and good means expressive and readable. You need to express things in, in a few lines of code, but it has to be readable. That, that's, that's, uh, I've been programming for a very long time, like more than 35 years, and it's probably the most important thing about programming language that I think of now. It's how easy it is to understand what the code is doing and how easy it is to understand what the intent behind the code is, actually is. And what is also very important if you want to manage lots of channels, you need a really good concurrency uh, model and good concurrency libraries. And for that, we chose the JVM and <coughs> Scala and Aka. So the JVM today, we believe that it's one of the most performant, reliable, and underrated runtimes you can think of. Nobody likes the JVM because nobody likes Java, but it, it, it's really awesome. Uh, it runs almost everywhere, uh, including phones. Uh, the, 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 the Eclair mobile wallet that some of you have been using to buy coffee, it's actually a, a stripped down version of our server node that is powering some of the biggest, biggest nodes on mainnet. It's almost the same application, just runs on, on the phone. It has really good memory management. It uses garbage collection, but there are many ways to, to gar garbage collection. Uh, the, the basic way is stop the world, that you stop everything, you compact your memory and you restart everything. This is really bad and Java is one of the best garbage collect collectors that you, that you can find today. Also because there are few uh, uh, virtual machines uh, that are few needs for garbage collection, but what you have in Java is, is, is extremely good. It, and performance is really good. A lot of people think that Java is slow, and it's not true, actually. Um, if you implement something in the simplest possible way, that you just uh, look at the algorithm and you implement it the way it's, it's described, the difference between native and Java code is, is not significant. It becomes very significant when you have domain experts that will optimize your code. There are things you can do with uh, C that you just cannot do with Java. And if you're ready to use assembly language and uh, other things, it's the, the difference between optimized and optimized doesn't mean that you, you compile with um, optimizer option. It means someone looked at the code and said, okay, someone who really understand what you're trying to do, looked at the code and said, okay, this is how you should do things. Then there could be huge differences between optimized code and Java code. But for this, it's not a problem because you can j simply call uh, native libraries. This is what we do with uh, SecB uh, 256K1. And that's basically where you spend your time in Lightning. What is really costly in Lightning is signing, verifying signatures. And for this, we can just use SecP 256K1 that is between 10 and 50 times faster than what you can find with uh, standard crypto libraries. But otherwise, the difference in performance between like, simple, naive implementations of algorithms between Java and C is, is not that big. And today we package SecP 256K1 in the application. So if you, if you run a cloud, you don't even need to worry about finding the bindings, compiling things. If you're running 64 bits, Linux, Windows, or uh, Mac OS, you, you get uh, SecP 256K1 for free. And it's also used on Android. But what is really nice about the JVM is you get awesome monitoring, debugging tools that's are really hard to get with uh, native code because when you, when you monitor the JVM, you are not monitoring your code. You are, you are monitoring the, the JVM that is running your code. It's a very different model. What, it, what, what I'm trying to say is, if you want to instrument your code, if, you're doing, uh, if you use C or something else, the, the, the thing you're running with the instrumented or debug code is not the thing you're running in production. It's not the same with Java. Do, 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 do you see what I mean? With Java, it's like you ask Java to give you information about what, about what is going on, CPU, memory, uh, call stack, everything, but it's, 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 there's an indirection that is really efficient, and it works for all the languages that you can find on the JVM. And this is something also that not many people know, but the JVM 
uh, J stands for Java, but it's not limited to, to, to Java. There are many languages you can use on the JVM. Uh, there's Java, there's Scala, there's Clojure, Groovin, Kotlin. You can run Python, you can run Ruby. Uh, it's used on uh, literally billions of devices. And what is really, really nice about the JVM is whatever you're trying to do, I mean, really, whatever you're trying to do, there's a good library for it. Uh, we found things for almost everything you can think of. And popular Java libraries have millions of users. Some of, of maybe 100 millions of users. So they kind of work. They're, they're tested heavily, and you can rely on them. So the, 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 the basic network stack and everything, you, 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 don't have to, you, you really have good options. You don't have to worry about things that are really not tested. And the tooling you get with the JVM is also really good. It's uh, like build tools, dependency management, but also monitoring, debugging uh, tools. It's, it's, it's really, really good. It's very easy to monitor Java applications, JVM applications, and see what are the hotspots, what are the memory problems you're going to be facing. Uh, it's that there's really good tooling for this. And Scala, I don't know, who has, who has used Scala? Okay, so it's, it's, okay, it's maybe one third uh, of the audience. Scala is like a hybrid, object-oriented, and functional programming language. And quoting somebody who is in this room today, it can be used as a better Java or as a worse Haskell, which is one of the problems with, uh, with uh, Scala, I'll explain a bit later, but it's, it's really nice. It has, it has lots of nice features like pattern matching, case classes, immutability, option type, which, you, which means you don't have to deal with uh, the null type, uh, futures for asynchronous programming. It's, it's really, really nice. It's very expressive. Usually when you port Java to Scala, you, the, the number of lines of codes is divided by between five and 10. And it's very readable. And by readable, it means when you read Scala code, you see what the code is doing, but you, you, you can also see what it's supposed to, to be doing. And that's very important. So it's not always true. And the biggest issue with, with Scala is that there are many ways to implement the same thing. So if you don't have a lot of discipline, uh, your code it doesn't scale very well with the size of the team. It's pretty hard for really large teams to, to, to maintain large uh, Scala code bases because there are so many different ways of doing things that if you let everybody do their own thing, after a while, your code base is, is, is really hard to maintain. It's not a problem we have, first, because we're a small team, and also because we're extremely strict on the type of changes we accept on our code base. So if you open pull request with us, it's, 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 you see we're a bit uh, we will ask you probably to rewrite a few things before it gets accepted because we want the code base to be consistent. And if you can keep your code, ba con code base consistent, you get something that is really, really easy to read. And it's something that is really good. It's not completely linked to the language, but it's the actor model. So who has heard of the actor model for concurrency, concurrent programming? Okay, so just, just a few people. Uh, the traditional currency is dealt with, with um, shared, shared states and locks. And it leads to all kinds of problems. You have contention issues. You have deadlock issues. It can be extremely hard to debug when you have an application where the state is shared and is spread all over the place with locks and everything. Basically, debugging, which means stopping something, it is, is useless because the rest is still going on. And it, it's, it's almost impossible to figure out what's going on because debugging will change the behavior of your application. So a traditional currency model is not really easy to use. The actual model is very different. Uh, state, the state of something is never, never, ever shared. What you do is you communicate through asynchronous message passing. So you have actors and you send messages to other actors and they reply with um, uh, like information about the state. But the state is never shared and messages are, are processed one at a time and sequentially. What it means is when you think about what, you, what you're doing inside an actor, it's extremely easy to reason, to, to, to reason with the model. It's re extremely easy to understand what's going on. You do things one thing at a time. You don't have to worry about locks or what's going on. So it's not a, a civil bullet. It's not a generic solution to all problems. But when it's a good match 
So what you're trying to do, it's, it, it's really awesome. Uh, and ACA, it's, it started as a, I, I'll take questions at, at, at the end, sorry. Yeah. ACA started as a port of Erlang OTP. Who know, who's heard about Erlang? Okay, more, more, actually more people than Scala. So Erlang is, is a language that was designed to build um, uh, software for, I think, phone companies at the start, Ericsson probably, and it's, it's, a, it's a niche language. Uh, they don't care about adoption. It's, it's really good for what it does, and, and it's, it's, it, it implements lots of things, including the Axel model, and it's, as ACA started as a port of Erlang to the JVM. And it, it includes actors, uh, finite state machine, TCP, HTTP client servers, logging, configuration, remoting. It's, it, it has lots of really good things, and it really works well. Um, I would say that ACA alone is a good enough reason to, to give Scala a try, because if you, if you have concurrency uh, issues, uh, Seeing how it's solved with ACA and the actor model is, 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 I think, quite interesting. You, you, you learn a lot. So this is, this is a basic example of an actor. It's, uh, it's, it does some simple calculation. This is your state, and you can set it. But if you send a message, you can add something to it. You can subtract uh, something to it, and you can get the state. And this is how it's used. So you send a message. The first one is get, so it's giving a state. You, then you set a state to 42, then you add one, and you get again. You subtract one, and you get the state again. So this is how you <coughs> define an actor, and this is how you use it. You send messages, and when you receive an answer, in this case, it's really basic, you, you print the answer. But that's a you, you, you really basic actor. But what is interesting is there are no locks. That's why it's really easy to reason with. When you are actually doing your own programming, you, you don't have to worry about locks or contentions, or it's, it's really simple. In this case, this is mutable, but it's not a problem because it's, there won't be concurrent access to the internal state. So what we did is we designed our system with actors, and basically this is a simplified view of our design, but you have a, an actor system, you have a switchboard that manages uh, TCP connections, it pipes messages to peers, so you have one connection for every peer, and for every peer you have different channels with, with, with our, with our, which are children of your peers. You have something that takes care of uh, authentication and encryption. You have uh, actors for the uh, router that uh, manages gossip messages and, and try to find routes uh, to your destination nodes, uh, things for handling payments. And all these are actors, so all communication is asynchronous through message passing. Uh, I could show you, for example, what it looks like. Uh, so this is, this is an example of uh, what the actual channel state machine is. And I would say that even if you don't really, if, if you don't know Scala, if you don't know Hacker, um, what, what, what we think anyways, the code is fairly easy to understand. It's fairly easy to, to understand what, what message you're processing, what you're doing, because everything is sequential and every single um, module is focusing on one thing only. In this example, uh, I'm asked to send an HTLC. If, if I can send it, I'm gonna, you can see there that if I can produce a valid HTLC, I will send it uh, to my P, otherwise there will be a problem and I will uh, fail the HTLC. You can see what happens when I receive an update. Uh, it's, it's fairly simple to understand what it does, but most importantly, it's fairly simple to understand what it's supposed to do. And that, to me, that's the, the uh, most important thing about code bases. So uh, what we have today is we use, obviously, we, we use our own dog food and we run Eclair in production. So we run Eclair on, on some of the largest and busiest nodes on mainnet and testnet. We have uh, hundreds of peers, thousands of channels. We have lots of short-lived connections from mobile applications that create lots of uh, uh, 
uh, traffic and are a bit special to, to handle with. This is not something you see on the explorers because all um, mobile channels are private. So if you look at our nodes on the explorers, you won't see that. But all the, all the channels you have uh, with your mobile mobile phone, they won't show up on explorers. So we actually manage many more than what you can see on, 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 on public explorers. It runs on a single machine. It's extremely reliable. We haven't had a database corruption ever. And until just a few weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, we never had one single crash in 18 months. It never crashed once. We had a crash. Um, <laughs> we had a crash two weeks ago because of an optimization that uh, was too clever, I think. Um, we, we didn't really optimize at the beginning. Uh, as the node grew and the number of peers and channels grew, we started to see that there were things we could do better. And now we have really lots of traffic, lots of nodes, lots of connections. And we have started to really optimize what we're doing. And the side effect is, OK, that, that one, one of the optimization was, was buggy. It's not something we released. So if you've been running our releases in a good environment, it, just doesn't crash. It, it crashes if you're running it on, on tiny machines with not enough memory and CPU. So the JVM does have an overhead. Uh, so if you want to use it on, on tiny uh, Pi Zero or something, it, you will probably run into issues. But if you have like one gigabyte of RAM and, and, and two, four CPUs, it's just you start it and you can forget about it. And it's very easy to monitor. That's a, a big thing for us. Uh, there were three of us for a really long time, so three of us to work on, on writing the code, running the code in production, the mobile app, uh, Strike, I don't know if some of you have heard of Strike, and other things, and on a really small team, having something that was easy to monitor and understand and debug was really important, and it, it, it worked fairly well. So. Um, I would say that in our point of view, obviously, uh, the recipe for the perfect lightning node is, is a good runtime, and that's the JVM. And again, it is better than you think. Um, an expressive, powerful language, Eclair now, it, it implements everything in the specs, uh, and it's basically 20,000 lines of code. Uh, it's really, really less than what our friends are doing. I don't know about um, Rust lightning, but uh, we, our estimation is about 150,000 uh, lines of code for C Lightning and LND. We have uh, seven times less and with the same uh, constraints. Um, and there's an awesome actor library. Uh, we've been using ACA for a really long time, even before we started Async. And we've never had a concurrency bug or performance or memory issue that was caused by Akka. So Akka is, is, is really awesome. But the big thing about Akka is it doesn't get in the way. Um, you, 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 you don't see it there. It's not a framework that you have to, 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 to fight with. It, it's, it doesn't get in the way. It lets you do what you want to do in a really easier to, to, easy to understand way. It's, it's, that's really great. So I would say that um, <laughs> I don't do usually lightning code, but when I do, um, I do it in Scala. <laughs> do you have questions? Yes. Are you planning any iOS? No, honestly, no, because the, the problem, OK, the question was, do we plan to, uh, to release an application for iOS? And the answer is no, because there, there aren't, there's no JVM on iOS. It's probably nearly impossible to get one. Uh, there are many issues. One of them is that the JVM uses a just-in-time compiler. It compiles your bytecode into native code. Apple doesn't want that. Apple doesn't want you to, to generate uh, runnable codes on the fly. Uh, for security reasons. Uh, basically, there are other options, but we could develop, we could build prototypes. We wouldn't really be comfortable uh, with the prototypes enough to run them on mainnet with actual users' money. So, un unfortunately, not, not soon. 
Yes. Um, have you been very disciplined in terms of the features you've added? Because like those performance stats and the number line effect have just seem incredibly good. Uh, have, you been, sorry. have you been very disciplined in terms of the features you've added to this information? Because the performance and the number line of code seems very nice. Okay, so the, the <laughs> there, are very few, there are very few lines of codes. One of the re reasons why is because on the JVM, there are many libraries. With, so, uh, we, there are many things we don't have to implement ourselves. I guess if you're doing uh, low-level coding with uh, C or Go, there are many things you need to do yourself. In our case, uh, networking, logging, monitoring, uh, a lot of things, are we, we, you just get it for free. We use Java libraries, we use Scala libraries, so that's one of the reasons why we didn't have to write that much code ourselves, because we just reuse existing libraries. Uh, the other thing is, um, in many ways, it's, uh, Lightning is very, is, is, is very complex, and at the same time, there are things that are fairly simple. I mean, you have a, a channel, you receive something, you update, and so the, 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 the the big chunk of code and the most uh, interesting one and, and the hardest one to, to get right was the channel, but the channel is a state machine and we have a really good state machine and a good model for that. I think it's worth slicing in some ways, like 50 lines of code is that. It's like hmm. once you strip out crap like the uh, downloading chain and all that stuff, it's a lot less effort. For example, you use a ton of you know, neutrino implementation and all kinds of secondary things that are somewhat tangential to like Ah, yes, also that's a good point. We don't have a wallet in, in our server node. We rely on your Bitcoin node. Uh, to get information, uh, blockchain information, blocks, headers, but also your wallet is your Bitcoin node. So we don't have, uh, if, if we had to see Lightning and, and go and um, LND have their own wallet, so that's a lot of code you have, to, you have to add that we don't need to write right now. Question from the live stream, and it's a bit hard to answer, I guess, but how many years does it take to learn Scala? <laughs> it, it, it depends where, you, where, where, where you're starting from. Um, I, 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 I don't think it's that bad. I mean, it's a language. I know the language has a reputation of being really hard to learn of, because it has many features. But <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you come from a functional programming point of view, like Haskell or Camel, whatever, it's, it's, I think it's going to be fairly easy. Uh, if you come from C or Java, you just need to get used to having functions everywhere. You get used to immutability. That's uh, the big difference between uh, most uh, C, Java uh, code and, and, and Scala. Is in Scala, everything is immutable. Basically, it's a, it's a discipline that you get used to. You, you, you never change anything. If x is 1, you, you don't write x equals x plus 1. You, you write x1 equals x plus 1. And you do it all the time, which means that when you're debugging, you don't have to worry about values changing or variables changing values because of something that is happening in somewhere else. It it's, makes it really easy to, to debug. But I would say in a, in a, in a, in a, few, in a few weeks, you can pick up Scala, I, I, I'd say. If you, uh, I like the JVM, but I like Java. Uh, you, you mentioned a few other languages before. Mm -hmm. Google seems to be pumping right now a lot of this uh, content. Uh, what would be, in a very good sentence, the trade-offs so far you have to take between the uh, Scala and Kotlin? OK, the, the, the big problem, the, OK, the question is there are many languages you can choose from on the JVM. One of them is Kotlin, and Google is, is promoting Kotlin, as, especially as a development language for the Android platform. Um, the big issue with Scala now, a really big issue, is that uh, you can't use Java 1.7, and Android is stuck at Java 7, which is more or less obsolete, and that's becoming a huge problem for everyone. Uh, it, it means you need to use all libraries. Some of them are, are obsolete or will become obsolete, which means you will probably have a hard time getting bug fixes. Um, 
Google is working towards having more Java 8 features. They don't have them now, so the big difference between Scala and, and Kotlin now is that Scala, the latest version, 2.12, it doesn't run on Android at all. So that's a huge problem, which is why we haven't switched to 2.12. Kotlin runs everywhere because Kotlin targets uh, Java 7. So, but I, it doesn't mean we would choose Kotlin today if we had to choose again, but we would probably think hard about it. We started with Scala a long time ago. Kotlin didn't exist yet. Uh, they, they, they're really similar. I think Kotlin is much simpler to learn at Scala. It's much less powerful, but it's, it's also a much better Java. So I don't see why anyone would choose Java over Kotlin today, but that's just, I don't, I don't use Kotlin, so. So why did we choose to use the Bitcoin as your wallets on, on our servers? Uh, because it was uh, the easiest choice at the time. Uh, it means you don't have to worry about uh, uh, wallet backup. So you, you back up your Bitcoin wallet and you're safe. Uh, it's, um, it makes the code base much simpler uh, because we don't have to implement a wallet. There's one impact though that you can see when fees are high. It means that we need to, for example, the, the, when you, a lot of uh, lightning transactions do not send money to your wallet. They send money to keys that are specific to your channel and if you want to return money to your wallet, you need to add one extra transaction. If you manage your UTXOs yourself, I think that's what LND does. You can have some kind of nursery where you, UTXOs that are not spendable grow, and as they get old, they become spendable. So it's more, it's more bookkeeping, but it's more efficient from a fee point of view. The downside of using Bitcoin Core as your wallet is we need to send everything back to Bitcoin Core, so when you close, you have one extra transaction uh, that returns money to your wallet. But we still think today that it's, it's it's much simpler for, from an operational point of view for backups, for uh, uh, understanding what's going on with uh, uh, failure modes and, 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 and closing channels, but it's a bit more expensive. Um, about the dependencies that you're using, I've been told from people working in the banking sector that they try to avoid using third-party libraries because they want to be sure that the code really just does what it's supposed to do and is secure. Um, you mentioned that the Java libraries are being used by millions of people. What, what is your thought on OPSEC and security there? It's, a, it, it's, it's really hard to, to answer that simply. Um, we, we, we believe that uh, from a security point of view, uh, uh, do you want me to repeat the question? So that, we use external Java libraries. Some people say that you should write everything yourself so you're in control of what's going on. And so what do we think from a security point of view? Uh, what is the trade-off between doing things yourself and using third-party libraries? The, the, the ones we use are uh, like networking libraries that are open source and that you can find everywhere. We don't think there are issues with that. Um, the biggest issue we could face would, would probably be um, uh, security issues linked to the JVM. Uh, some of you may remember that a long time ago, there were, uh, the, the security of Java applets was, was appalling. But that's a very different uh, problem because Java applets were running code that you did not control at all. And it, it, it was a mess. Uh, we run our own code, so we believe we're fairly safe and we don't have to deal with uh, low-level errors you get with uh, like memory errors, some memory errors are just impossible to, to, to get on, on a garbage collected language like, like uh, Scala or Java. So we, we think we're safe today, but it's, 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 it's hard to, 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 uh, to give a simple answer to that. All, the, all the, the important code is done by us. Everything that is related to Bitcoin and Lightning, we do ourselves. Yes, so um, obviously there are some differences between uh, a player running on uh, a tool like KVM and on Android. Could you say something about the differences there? And like especially using like a full node as your role? Yes. How do you do this on mobile? 
Yes, that's a really good question. So the, dif the question is, what, what are the differences between Eclair on servers and Eclair on Android? The big difference is the wallets. We can't obviously use your Bitcoin node as your wallet. So we, we use Electrum servers, uh, thanks Thomas, to, to manage our wallets on, on Android. So we add extra code to basically, we have our own Electrum clients, our own implementation of uh, an Electrum client that connects to Electrum servers to retrieve your uh, UTXO and transaction history. This is how we manage the wallets on Android. And that, that is the part that is really specific. The rest is basically it's the, the, the same code with things that you don't do. Yeah? You don't relay payments on Android. Uh, the network information you have, you don't send it back to other nodes because it's, it's partial anyway. So but it's, it's multi things we remove. But the big difference is the wallet. Yes. To add on to this question, have you tried compiling uh, the server version on Android? Could, could you use it on an Android device? Could, I, could we use the server version? You mean the one that connects to Bitcoin nodes? Yeah. We haven't tried. Uh, I'll try that. Shall we have to face an immigration to Scala 3? Uh, we can't even migrate to Scala 2.12, so it's, it's, it's not an open question now. What version is 2.11, because of Android. Mm -hmm. um, so, how many private channels does Ascend have? Uh, overall, uh, several thousand uh, that are live at the same time. Uh, as many as, as you have uh, applications running concurrently on your phone, so it could be hundreds. And do you know about the channel, if it's from a mobile or from a or an Android wallet, or, uh, or do you have no clue at all? No, so the question was, what do we know about the, the, the application that is on the other side? Is it your question? Yeah. Lightning, the way it's designed, you, you don't really know what you're talking to. It could be LND or C Lightning or Eclair or something else. But there are things you can do to learn, especially error messages. All, the, all implementations have their own typical way of formatting error messages. So if there's a problem, usually you, you can tell who you're talking to. But if you connect to someone, if everything is happening, uh, if there are no errors, it, it's a bit harder to tell who you're connecting to. Yes, it's reachable over at all. It's been reachable over at all for, for a few months now. And will the slides be available? Yes, I would think so, yes. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so obviously the async node is pretty big. And you said, it, can you say something about the hardware it runs on? And how cheap hardware do you think would manage this node uh, of this time? Okay, it runs on AWS, and it's uh, one extra large machine, so it's... Uh, I, I, honestly, I don't remember if it's 16 or 32 CPUs and, and a, few gig, a few gigs of memory, but it's, it's, it's really specific because it's, 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 it's fairly big. But if you, if you want to run nodes yourselves, uh, unless you, you plan to have really huge number of channels, Anything with uh, more than two CPUs and, and one gig of RAM is, is enough. But do you think you could run a node that size on your laptop? Yeah. On a... Mm -hmm. uh, it would probably run. It would be slow, but it, it would probably run, yes. On a, uh, like not, not a tiny laptop, yes. The, the using SecP was, is, is, is the, it changes a lot. Uh, we, it, it makes a huge difference. Especially now, if, if you use Eclair, it was a bit harder to get SecP to work because you, you had to provide it yourself. Now it's, it's bundled in and you see that it, 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 it makes a change. Uh, did you compare, compare the memory usage with other implementations? No. Uh, no. We don't, we don't really run uh, other implementations, and we know that DVM, there's an overhead. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't show a lot, but it, it, let's say it, it, is, it, it will eat an extra 150 megs, maybe 200 megs. 
So on most hardware, it doesn't really matter. But on tiny hardware, it's sometimes it can be a huge problem. But we haven't looked at other implementations. So, so you would expect that it, it would take more memory than, for example, yes, learning. yes. Okay. But uh, can you say the how much more? No. Two x, three x. Oh no, no, no. It's uh, same memory plus three hundred megs, and maybe. Just, just some constant, yeah, right? I would, I, I would think so. Yes. Uh, I think the easiest solution is to start several nodes. Uh, it, we thought about how you could write some kind of proxy load balancer of a lightning node. It's not that easy. So we would probably run. Uh, you, you don't expect to run into issues at the current code? No. Rate, no. Or any type of no, no, not, not anytime soon, no. You can, you can connect to any uh, Lightning node that uh, supports channel queries, and that's most of them now, and uh, data loss protect. So no, you don't have to connect to us. Uh, yeah, so I mean, there are no scalability issues. No? no. I would say a lot of people choose to connect to us because it's, it's, it's simple. But we also have, uh, we, we see on, on our uh, GitHub forums that a lot of users connect to their own nodes, and often it's LND. So, but you can connect to any node that, that implements Lightning. Do the individuals and where are the resources for logging uh, compatibility issues between the various implementations? Who's overseeing that or spending time? Uh, so, so, what are the resources for dealing with uh, compatibility issues at the Lightning level spec? Uh, l l l l uh, the first resource is uh, the spec repo. So uh, if you, s you find something that is ambiguous, you ask a question on, uh, you, you would typically file an issue on, on, on the spec repo, say this maybe is a bit hard to understand. Matt did, it, did that a few times. The Japanese team did that a few times. Uh, and if you have a specific bug with a specific implementation, usually you would file an issue on that implementations uh, GitHub repo. All of them are open source, so what, what, what do you do from time to time? If we, if, if we have a bug and we think it's a, it's a spec compliance bug, we would file, we'd try to file an issue and explain as well as we can why we think it, it's a spec bug. <coughs> Is there anybody who can say, like, so you've got something, is anyone on C Lightning or LMD who's spending time with us? Yes. I think every implementation is, is looking at, we, we, we all try to, be, to implement the spec. It, it really, it's really important because uh, Lightning is, is really trigger happy. So when you have a problem, your channel gets closed. So it's, it's really annoying for end users because uh, the way Lightning is designed, you don't really know what's going on. It's not designed to give you information on specific information of what's going on. It's actually quite the opposite. It's really hard to debug because of that. So, but basically, if you're an end user, if there's a problem somewhere, your, your channel will, will close and you won't be happy because you have to open one again, you have to wait, you have to pay on chain fees. So everybody is really concerned about implementation bugs, spec compliance bugs, but unless you, you, have to, you have to find them and you have to file issues and you have to solve them, it's... There are very... Ve just reporting to both implementations. If I've got a channel open, Yes, it, it, yes, it happens. Typically, if you run your own node, uh, if, you are, if you're on two nodes with two different implementations, you see something that is wrong, you may file an issue with both right. implementations and see, okay, what's going on? And it, it happens a few times. With Bitrefill, did that a few times with us and with LND, for example. Uh, that's a very good question. How do users report bugs? Uh, on server application, desktop application is fairly easy. On Android, it's actually fairly hard because logs are not enabled by default. So if you have a problem, hopefully it's something you can reproduce. 
what we tell people is you activate logs and you send us your logs. We log uh, things locally. You just send us your logs and we try to, to, to help. But it's, it's much harder on mobile applications. So why don't we enable logs by default? Because of issues with, um, we, we, we could uh, in some li limited way, but th the way our logs are designed, they, they get to go, grow really quickly. Uh, if you want debug information that is really useful, you need to log a lot of things. So it, right now, it's been slightly better to have logs disabled by default. And when there's a problem, we ask people to enable them. Send, send them to us, there's enough info to understand what's going on, and then disable logs again. We have that question because we disable logs by default on Alec for, mm. for privacy reasons. So is that a concern for you? No, because on, on Android, uh, isolation works very well. So Android applications, and not, not like applications you run on servers or desktop. Uh, Europe cannot read other applications' but data. I don't know, on, on desktop it's enabled by default. On, on desktop, if your machine is compromised, honestly, it's, it, if you don't trust the machine you're running knows with money on it, then you have a problem. Well, the wallet is encrypted, so if the log is not encrypted, uh, someone looking at the log could... Uh, okay, so yes, logs, the logs don't, will not ever give out uh, private keys or anything that you can use to steal money. No, of course. But Pardon? yes, you can get uh, information about keys that belong to someone, like addresses, Bitcoin addresses that belong to someone, channels that belong to someone. Um, I don't really think it's an issue. That's, that's privacy. That's yeah, but you can lose privacy. It's, it's an issue. Yeah, what, what exactly is your scenario? Someone takes control of your machine, and it's bad because you can steal your logs. It, it, they can do much worse. Maybe the scenario is that you, as a company, will know which address to belong to me and will check. That's yeah, but the concern, maybe. I'm afraid, yeah. Okay, maybe we. I, I, I'm not sure I really understand the, the, the concern. I mean, so, if the developers know which addresses belong to me, and you can link them together. No, 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 no. Okay, so. The, the, the logs, yeah, the, the, the question is about the, the privacy issues linked to what we log and how it's available. I was talking about the logs you have on your node, not the logs we have on our node. So maybe that's why I don't really understand your concern. Are you talking about what we log on async's uh, nodes on mainnet? No, locally for the user, yeah. uh, users do not have an expect, uh, do not expect the application to Log what they do. So, it, unless they take the step of enabling the logs, I mean, uh, for some users, it would probably not be okay to discover that everything that has they, that they have been doing with the application has been logged. Why? Well, okay. So let me clarify. I mean, eclair obviously is a lightning wallet. It's because it is a lightning wallet. It's a port wallet. So all the keys are always unlocked anyway. Running. Yes. But if you have a cold wallet, um, so if, if you have a non lightning wallet, just a Bitcoin wallet, for example, which is encrypted and you don't have the keys on a wallet all the time, you, your privacy is also encrypted. I mean, your, your list of addresses, for example, is not exposed unless you decrypt the wallet. But if you have a debug log which contains your list of addresses, maybe even just implicitly, then you lose privacy. But because you're a hot wallet, all the keys are always unlocked, this is not uh, any extra risk for you. Uh, no, maybe I should discuss that with you a bit later. But no, if, if the, the problem is someone has access to your machine remotely and can steal your logs and learns about your addresses, yes, it's a, it's a problem. But that's not, in my opinion, the biggest problem you have. Remotely or physically? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I understand, but your your wallet is encrypted, but uh, there's information about your activity on there. Yeah. Yes. If you worry about that, please. I 
think it's also a very early days. Uh, having ones in the early days and then just removing them. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and also, uh, I, I agree with Stefan. My, my, uh, for example, I think it's compulsory to encrypt your disk and your phone, everything, full disk encryption. So if, if you steal my laptop, you're going to have a really hard time uh, stealing my logs. Now, if you can access my laptop while I'm running it, Honestly, I think this, the biggest problem I will have is probably not the fact that you can see my logs. If your uh, wallet is encrypted, it's a uh, time constraint when, when you access your laptop. Yeah, but if I can access your laptop, I will not steal your logs. I will plan some kind of malware, wait until you start Bitcoin, and then when it started, steal everything you have. So, honestly, I... I'd need to think a bit more about this, but no, it's... Basically, it's uh, a bit more uh, longer privacy uh, uh, to, to be for a bit more complexity on your application yeah. side. T to be clear, the, our application does not send anything to us. So we, we, we don't send debug information automatically or diagnostics or whatever, nothing. So if you have a problem, we will ask you to get the logs and send them to us. If you don't want to do that on a public forum, we will ask you to send us an email or private chat or whatever. But the, by default, we don't send anything uh, to our servers, if that was the, 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 the question. But now if someone can access your machine, they will not steal your logs. They will plan some kind of malware and wait until you do something where they can actually get money. Um, are you actually it's it's okay. The question is, do we plan to use Neutrino when it's when it's um, uh, available? It's a very good question. So you, you all know what Neutrino is, right? Um, we're looking at it. There are things that it does that are really nice, like the proof of inclusion that you get with the filters is really good. Uh, it gives you a way to know that your channels are being spent in a specific block. That, that's really good. Uh, I do believe that it will be more work to implement a wallet with Neutrino than it is today with the Electron protocol, but um, uh, it, it's something we're looking at. But we, uh, we have not decided to move from Electron to Neutrino. Do you need Bit 157? Bit 157 and 158. One of them is for the filters. The other one is for the network messages you exchange with Bitcoin node to retrieve filters. So what happens if you merge before you can Can you repeat the question? Yeah, can you speak louder? Sure. Um, bit 157 would need to be merged for you to consider using it. So, oh, it so the, using the question is, do we, 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 we Will we wait until Neutrino B157 is merged into Beacon Core before we use it? Yes, probably. Well, specifically also, Neutrino and LND is connected to, there's only how many BTCD nodes out there that support the filters too. So effectively, the Neutrino and LND is just connecting to not much of a better model than electron servers because you're connected to just really a few nodes, most of them probably run by uh, like enthusiasm. <laughs> eventually, eventually it will improve, but currently it's not really a button. Okay. Is there any electronic implementation that you recommend to use uh, to set up your node the mobile part? Uh, you can connect to any. Uh, uh, w w you can connect to e any Electrum server. You can connect to your own own server if you have a valid SSL certificate. Sorry. If you have a valid SSL certificate, it's something we require. Uh, do you mean what do we prefer between Electrum X and Electrum Elect RS? Yeah, basically. I, I, I don't know. Ask, ask Thomas. I, don't, I, I, I wouldn't really know. Well, I'm more familiar with Electrum X 
but I, yeah, I haven't tried the, uh, the rest one, so I don't know. It, it seems to me that most Electrum servers are running Electrum X, like 80% yeah. maybe, or 90%. If, if you're running a private server just for yourself, then probably both are fine. Mm. But Electrum X specifically has a lot of partnering against DDoS and, mm. and uh, malicious clients and stuff like that. So if you are running a public-facing server as a volunteer, then, then the, I would suggest, at least for the moment, Electrum X. It's also easier for us to push new features into Electrum X because it's Python, and uh, yeah, we work together with the developers of Electronics. So uh, when, whenever we need something, it's, it goes there first. Got a question from here. I'm not sure if it makes sense. Uh, I, uh, how can I balance my channel without opening the testing? Balance. Yeah. <laughs> it, there's, I, 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 I can't really answer it. It, it. If you want to balance your, ch I, I, I don't think you really need to balance your channels, first thing. It's, it's something that pops up really, really often. I don't know if it's the same with, uh, with you guys at, at Lightning Labs, but a lot of people ask us, how do I balance my channels? I don't think you need to worry about balancing your channels. Uh, if you really want to do that, you need to find some kind of way back to you through another channel. But honestly, it, it's not that much of a concern now. There's no theory behind wanting to have 50 no. outbound. No, it's, I, I don't know why. It's a question we get all the time. People want like 50-50 balance. At, at, no, it, it's... I suppose you have to look at it probabilistically in terms of the chances of being able to route away from you and route into you. Uh, it would be enough in both directions. <laughs> can, can you elaborate a bit about routing? Are you using Dextra for now? And are you planning to, I don't know, what's your view on pathfinding in terms of scalability when we have many, many more nodes? Is Dextra viable? OK, so the question is about uh, pathfinding uh, in Lightning. It's, it's a really good question because pathfinding is not part of the Lightning specs. The specs define once you have found the route, what you do with it, how you create the packet that is sent to all the nodes. But never in the specs does it say, are you supposed to compute routes? You do whatever you want. You can ask. Mostly it's slow because you try, it fails. Yeah. You try again, it fails. You try again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, blame it on, on, on Matt.